This episode is sponsored by Lupton Capital, which provides a variety of investment services to both retail and institutional investors on platforms such as Seeking Alpha, Substack, and StockTwits. For more information on these services or for links to those services, please visit LuptonCapital.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Investor Wells podcast. My name is Jonah Lupton. Super excited for another great guest. It is Mark Ritchie II. Right, Mark? <laughs> Make sure That's I correct. get that second in there. Uh, how are you, Mark? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to uh, what's going to be a fun conversation. So talk to us about what is your strategy? I know you told me kind of pre-roll that you're uh, kind of a quasi trader slash investor, but maybe you can explain it better for us. How do you, and I, and I, you don't run any outside money. So right now you're just managing your own capital. Uh, so what is your personal strategy? Yeah. So big, you know, big question it, before even labeling anything is like, I would, I, I always generally describe myself as a risk reward guy, meaning I'm always thinking about risk reward uh, in, in everything and then how to quantify that and and manage it properly. You know, I usually tell people this is a risk management business first, at least if you want to be successful. So if, if you're not thinking about that, um, Rather than the opportunity set and all those other type of things, you know, uh, the question I get more than anything else is, "What's your favorite stock?" Because I I trade primarily equities, but I do trade some commodities and uh, and even crypto as well, um, currencies to a lesser extent. Uh, I kind of came into the business a little bit, you know, from the commodity side, and I even come from a family of commodity traders, if you will, most of which were floor, you know, type like the old old school yelling and screaming in pits. Um, but uh, yeah, mine mine is really just one where a directional tr- directional trader, um, and then you know thinking about things from a low risk entry point standpoint. Meaning, and the way I describe that is so that I can know very quickly how to time things or how my timing is. Meaning, have I timed this correctly or not? Because uh, I want to I want to move the capital to where it's potentially going to be most efficient quickly. Uh, I'm not against uh, holding things for a longer term move, uh, um, but I want to catch the move with a gain to begin with. I don't want to just buy something or or on the short side, if you're shorting. Uh, I don't do a lot of shorting, but if I was, I would take the same philosophy. And I do when I do short, meaning I'd rather I'd rather be proven right early on in terms of so I don't have to sit around and wait forever for my thesis to be uh, proven correct. Uh, I'll just move move my capital to where I think it's going to be more efficient, if that makes sense. How, how long will you stay in a new position if it's not moving? I mean, how much, how patient are you willing to be? Or does it just, just depend on where your stops are? And if you get stopped out, then so be it, you move on to the next thing. It would, it would be, a, if I have a predetermined plan, which I always do, though, you know, the, the stop is the first thing. Usually, I tend to be wrong quickly, you know, meaning uh, even if it's a trade, my average, you know, trade on a loss is somewhere between two and three days. So I know relatively quickly, was my timing good? Was it not? Now, on top of that, sometimes I'll have even tighter timing where I have an expectation. This is what I'm expecting to happen. If it doesn't happen, I just step aside. Now, and, I, and that way, I may, I may even try it again one or two, three times to say, you know, I'm, I'm expecting, you know, for lack of a better word, this train to come in at this time. If it doesn't, I'm looking for another train. Um, so... But g- generally, this is where all my losses are trades. They're not investments. <laughs> like, I don't take investment losses. I take trading losses. Uh, and then occasionally, um, I w- I'll try and use some of those trading gains um, and hold a-, a portion of those positions into a longer term hold, but from a position of strength. And is the reason for you're holding them a longer period of time just because you believe in the stock for longer term, or is there a tax component to it as well? Uh, there's to be real clear. There's never a tax component at all in, in terms of my risk management decisions. Okay. Uh, and I get that question every now and again too. It's like, well, you know, have you ever thought about, you know, what do I do with all these, you know, short-term capital gains? It's like, well, first of all, be thankful you have any capital gains. Um, do your patriotic duty, just pay your taxes. Uh, and, <laughs> And th- that's a good problem to have. Right. Uh, my my reason for holding something longer term would be because I have I've caught the the timing correct. Maybe I've got a stock that's breaking out of a big base. Now I've 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 timed the the trade perfectly. 
Uh, now I have good, you have all good options, right? When you're in a winning position um, and you're at a, say a multiple of, of your risk, the world is your oyster. Uh, you know, you, you can, you can just turn it and burn it, take all the profits. You can, you can hold it all and try and play for a much bigger move, or you can do some type of a hybrid, which is generally what I would do. Now I would only hold something and a bigger move for me would be months to quarters. I've occasionally held some for even longer. Um, but I'm holding profits and then I'm just sitting there calculating how much will, how much am I willing to give back on this position? Uh, where are the pain points? Uh, where am I going to say I, I'm, I'm out, I'm taking profits. Uh, so it's, it's the old, you know, you've, you've probably heard and many have heard the old adage, never let, you know, a losing trade turn into an investment. I want to do though, the exact opposite. Why not let a winning trade finance an investment? If you think about that logically, right. you know, people do markets have this funny way of making people just do really irrational things. You know, if if you give somebody an idea, let's say, you know, buy XYZ stock and they buy it, but you go, it, it moves against me, I'm gonna get out. Uh yet how many people, and once it moves against them, go, well, I'll I'll just wait till I get back to where I got it. Oh God, yeah. Right. You hear that all hear that all the time. And and what I've what I've sort of said in explaining this to people is if I brought you an idea and I said, best case scenario, you 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 make nothing, you get out at even. And worst case scenario, you lose every penny you put into it. Would you go for it? Of course, everyone rolls their eyes and goes, well, Why would I do that? That's effectively what you're doing when you say, Well, I'll, you know, I'm just gonna hang on to this dog and get out at even. So best case scenario, you're going to scratch. And worst case scenario, you're just going to hang on and hang on and hang on and hang on as it just goes against you. By the way, that's what lots of people have been doing in this market for the uh, past 20, 2021, 2022. That's what a lot of growth investors that's did. Yep. Un, and they've gotten absolutely carried out. Right. And they say, uh, I, if I loved it at 200, then I'll love it at 100. And next thing you know, you love it at 50 and you love it at 25. And you know, or, you're- Or you're, to your, this is a really great point, Jonah, because what happens, yeah, gross guys then all of a sudden become value guys. Right. <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> Wait a second. You, you, have to, you have to stick to, you know, to your own knitting and your own area of, of competency and discipline. It's like, you know, again, the brain surgeon doesn't show up at the podiatrist office and tell them all, all the stuff about a foot. But yet, you know, in, in the markets, somebody all of a sudden is a growth momentum guy and then they become a value guy. And, and the returns go absolutely the wrong way when you adopt that type of thinking. So what's a, what's a typical uh, starter position size for you? When you say size, you mean, like say percentage of the account? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's say you're eyeing, I don't know, NVIDIA, Tesla for a new position, sure. uh, 5%, 10%. Well, first, it's all going to be a function of how well am I trading. Uh, meaning, now, normally a a large position for me would be anything over fifteen percent. So that would be you know fifteen to twenty five percent would be an, a more aggressive line. Um, I don't usually ever take anything over twenty five. Um, in some of the earlier days, I would occasionally, but not not much beyond that. And personally, I don't I don't think it's really necessary. I think you can e even if you're going for bigger returns. Um, I, I mean, I do know people. I know individual traders who will put their whole. I, I couldn't whole, do it. I I wouldn't I, yeah. sleep at night. <laughs> well, and I, I know I know some individual guys who will put their whole account in one stock. Oh, oh to man. be clear, I, to be even clear for some of the guys I know that do that well, they are watching it like an absolute hawk, though. Yep, and to your yep. point, they know you know, their gut can handle it. Um, and they're only doing that though, from a position of, of strength. And what I mean by that is they're seeing the ball. Well, their account is probably a new equity highs and they have in their recent trading, they're probably on a good run. So it's like, they're, they're doing what I like. They're taking that right tail of the trading distribution and really trying to step on the gas where things are really working. Um, so, but normally yeah, a bigger position would be anywhere 15%. Now starting a position, this is where if I'm seeing the ball, well, and what, you know, I, I'm borrowing a little bit of that from a lot of other good traders, but Stan Druckmann, no one talks about that. Uh, he, I just heard him recently talking about that. It's like, well, I feel like glad to be in, you know, really good company in terms of the way I think about it. But if you, whatever your sport is, if you're in a, in the groove or in the zone, um, you don't have to be cautious. Uh, and so there have been times where, yeah, things are working. I'll, I'll go right to a big size right off the hop. Um, some of that will depend on, the quality of the setup though, too, where again, if I'm really, if I'm 
market is in a good environment and I'm feeling like my timing is good and I'm expecting the stock to move right here, right now, I'm not going to slowly build a position. I'm right. going to go in and stomp on the gas, you know, or I'm coming in guns blazing, shooting first and asking questions later. But that's, that's a rare percentage of the time. You know, that's not, most people think, you know, even traders, if somebody has a good year or, or traders are just gunslingers, like usually the, certainly at least in the directional type of style and philosophy that I'm talking about, it, it, it's more the opposite. They're very, they're selectively aggressive. You know, they're, they're picking their spots very carefully. And then when they see what they want to see and they have that conviction, that's when they kind of can go big. So normally then I would build into a position. And so I would, I would generally start with, you know, a five or 10% line and then build my way up if things act well. And because most, if we're talking just charts and technicals, they're not perfect. You know, they're, they're good enough or you see enough, uh, criteria that are enough elements that meet your criteria where you can say, this is a good risk reward. And then if it improves, you add to it. So I, I, I often, and I, I do the same thing generally, even getting out of a position. I tend to trade in scales. So if I trade in, you know, five or 10% blocks is kind of how I do it. And how much does the overall market trend or what the indexes are doing impact your specific trading style? Um, you know, if, if the indexes are not making new highs, if the indexes are getting, you know, rejected at previous resistance levels or, you know, they're below their 200 day moving average or 50, whatever it might be, does that impact your style? Or do you think, okay, there's always, always stocks breaking out. So I don't care so much about what the indexes are doing. I'm focused on these three, four five stocks. Well, it's, as far as the general overall trend of the market, it's, it's impactful. You know, obviously the last 12 months being a good example as we've been in a bear market and specifically the overall participation within the market has been very poor, even as the market has rallied off the bottom. Um, you know, the indexes have bounced off the bottom. They've masked quite a bit of weakness. Oh yeah. Very, uh, very narrow, very narrow leadership. It's a very narrow market. Anybody who, who, doesn't own the indexes and owns a basket of individual stocks will tell you that because they'll go, you know, the, whatever the S&P is up 10%. Why, why is my portfolio flat or down even? Well, because it's been being carried along by just a few names. So I, that's where I would tend to watch not just the indexes, but the actual breadth within them. I, I put much more weight on that. So if an, if an advance is extremely robust, uh, that's going to, you know, that's going to be very much more favorable for me. And it's also a tell as it starts to weaken that says, you know, I either need to be playing smaller um, or moving to the sidelines. You know, the, the top that we really had in 21 was a classic example of that. So I look at those things as secondary indicators, but I would never not trade because the indexes are doing X. You know, I don't sit there and go, well, I got to wait for confirmation from the indexes. Never. Stocks lead. And actually, that's one of the big traps uh, for a lot of folks. If they they want to trade stocks, yet they they obsess about what the queues are doing. And it's like, well, if you want to trade the queues, then just go trade the queues. Right. <laughs> uh, wh why why does why does that matter? You know, and because this whole concept of indexing, you know, like the, and benchmarking and all the you know like an et the ETFization of everything, as I've talked about, it's like the, <laughs> these are products designed by brokers and fee collectors. Um, for people, and I mean, really for for people yeah. who couldn't invest and trade, mind you, it's like the whole indexation. You know, I think Jim Rogers recently said was like, that, you know, this was created by by brokers so they could collect like fees off stuff, um, rather or diversification was what he was saying about that too. Where you know, I kind of take the opposite view. If I want to trade the individual names, and you have to have a process that, in some ways, almost lets you um, not be completely uh, ignore them, but to to quiet their overall influence is to say, you know, I want to look under the hood of the index and figure out, you know, and, and even gauge my opinion in the market off of all the, the way the stocks under the surface are trading rather than just say, looking at the Dow or looking at the S&P. And even though the queues have been leading the, the markets this year and NVIDIA, Meta are all up huge, Apple, Microsoft, I mean, there's still a lot of stocks that have done very well. You know, Celsius is being one of my big winners. You look at Elf, the cosmetics company. I mean, there's a lot of these individual names that have done very well this year. They're just not in the NASDAQ or the S&P. So they just, you know, they get kind of forgotten. So how do you find 
how do you find stocks? Like, do you wake up every morning and run a specific screener? Do you have a list of a hundred different stocks that you like to trade and you go through those and look for your favorite setups? Like, how do you start to build your watch list every day? Yeah, it's a, a, sort of a combination of what you just described. Uh, you know, and it, the screens that we tend to run are pretty simple. Uh, you know, we use things like relative strength. We do look at sales and earnings. You know, anything that some of your classic, you know, growth momentum type folks would use. But then it's just uh, compiling a list uh, through that. So, you know, the more you screen, the more you just sort of develop uh, a little bit of a, of, a, of a tape sense or a feel in terms of where is the strength rotating? Where is money rotating? Um, and you know, what you just described in terms of about like specific companies, even in a bear market, like a Celsius or an elf, um, you know, that are doing well, well, those were sticking out like a sore thumb six to nine months ago, you know, because they're bucking the overall trend. Those stocks are in their own cycle. They're, they're marching to the beat of their own drummer. Um, well, or something like relative strength will pick that up. Now it doesn't mean of course that that's always going to continue. That's, you know, that's where the risk management thing comes in. It's, there's no, uh, there's no perfect screener. Um, the screener to me just helps you take a, you know, a, a very wide, wide net and make it a little bit smaller to a universe that then you can sort of pull uh, to an even, you know, it's like a sieve, you know, you're, you're just, you're filtering through all these things. Uh, and generally where the strength is, is indicative of the risk appetite for the overall market, specifically the big players in the market, the institutions. If there's a, critique right now, it's that, you know, me mega cap leadership is not enough. It doesn't mean that that won't drive the indexes higher. But if if institutions are not willing to take to go out the risk curve beyond, you know, just a few stocks that they're really outside the top 10. <laughs> yeah, outside the top 10. You know, it just tells me there's not a ton of appetite for risk right now. Um, and when that changes, uh, and it will at some point, let's let's that's for sure. Um, if or when that changes is often when, you know, guys like me will tend to do better in a period like that, uh, at least on the long side, because there's just, there's more, it, it's, it's like having more merchandise on the store shelves to choose from, you know, good problem to have. Well, it was like back in, was it March or April where, I, you know, my stops were just getting chewed up constantly. You know, the market was just so choppy. Breakouts weren't, you know, breakouts were failing, uh, you know, the stocks were slicing through their 10 day, their 21 day. So I think it was March or April. I had a pretty crappy month. Otherwise, it's been pretty decent. But what are your favorite setups? Do you like the the breakouts, the new highs? Do you like the the stocks that gap up on earnings and then pull back to their moving averages and then bounce off those? Um, like what what are your favorite setups? When you're going through your going through your charts in the morning, what are you really looking for? Yeah, as a general rule, I'm looking at things that are already in existing uptrends, and then I am looking for some type of consolidation within that uptrend. So it's like you're sort of you're stacking a few things on top of each other. Obviously, uh, you know, good fundamentals are are great. I would I don't I wouldn't require them though. Uh, you know what we often say, uh, and and anybody who wants to learn more about this can check out you know stuff I would do on Twitter or, you know, I'm an analyst at Intervening Private Access as well, um, where we're always talking about, uh, you know, that we'll trade something on technicals, just on technicals, um, but we're never going to trade something just on fundamentals. So it's like, and if something's got great fundamentals, great. I want to wait for technical confirmation. Uh, and some people, again, value people think that's crazy. Oh, you're missing all this great opportunity. Well, it's like, if it's such a great opportunity at some point, it's going to turn up, get into an uptrend and then have a consolidation. And to my very first point, it's like, I'm using those technical consolidations to know if my timing's right. Cause I'd much rather know re in relatively short or if I'm right or wrong. So long, you know, I want the long-term trend at my back. I don't want to be fighting it. Uh, and then I'm waiting for you know those that shorter term trend in terms of a consolidation to line up with a longer term trend. Um, you know I don't want to get into all the semantics and technicals because you know that's that's almost like a class if you will. I was just going to ask. I mean, when someone says trading technicals, I assume that includes price. Does that include volume as well and RSI? Like, is that all included in technicals? Yeah, good. really good uh, question. I don't use any other, for lack of a better word, technical indicators other than price and volume. Okay. Um, I'm 
I'm not going to knock somebody else's discipline that likes, you know, whatever Bollinger bands or money flows. And I, I don't even, I couldn't even tell you <laughs> about those things because those, <laughs> those aren't what I use, you know? And, and it's funny if you see any moving averages or things like that in my charts, which I do have, they're almost like defaults, but I don't sit there and go look at what the, you know, whatever period moving average is doing. Uh, I just, I just look at the price and volume. Um, and that, that's kind of what I've always used. Um, but as far as then, you know, specific setups, I'm usually just looking for, you know, specific consolidations in price, you know, or tight technical action. Um, you know, the way I, I've, I've jokingly described, you know, charts is like, if you send me a chart and you're like, Mark, check this out. I love it or whatever. And it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, have the look to my eye. It's just, it's almost like it doesn't matter to me. It's, it's noise. I think a lot of technical stuff out there is noise. However, um, you know, and I, I will say is like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna quantif quantifiably define what a good technical setup is, but I know it when I see it, you right. know, the okay. old, I just, it, it, you do it enough, you know, it's like your eye just picks up on things and, you know, you screen 500 to a thousand charts a day. Uh, after a while, your eye gets, you know, just very good at, you know, not interested, not interested, not interested. All of a sudden, okay, put that one on the list, you know, and that's just, that's exactly how, how we do it every day. I mean, I wake up at five every morning and I go through probably five or 600 charts and it only takes me hour and a half maybe because I can just go through them. Just like you said, real fast. I know within five seconds, if that's a chart that I want to go anywhere near that day. <laughs> well, and I think it's a really good point though, too, in terms of that People are surprised at what that 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 discipline really works. One, but two, what else? It, it consistent application of discipline. You know, like like a Malcolm Gladwell. It was like the five thousand or ten thousand hour rule. It's like, how did someone get you know find all these little nuances and c- catching all these little things? Well, it's it takes that time and experience, and you just develop a better feel for the market. You know, so sometimes when people ask me, well, you know, what do you think about? market right now. And I'm like, I, I don't really have any interest. Uh, when it's be, it's coming from exactly what you just described. You're doing that day in, day out, day in, day out, all of a sudden. And they can also help me change my opinion very quickly because, you know, it's amazing how quickly the market can shift, you know, things can look great. And then they can, they can start to look, you know, really sick, really fast. And just when you think like the world's going to come to an end, all of a sudden there's a lot of stocks that, that are looking interesting. And then they start moving and breaking out. And, you know, so it, it, it's just a way of keeping me honest too, in terms of rather than digging in with an opinion, I, you know, I'm being more of the caboose. That's why, I mean, I, I almost posted on Twitter the other day. I didn't because I didn't want to, you know, stir the hornet's nest, but I almost posted something, posted something along the lines of anyone can be a good trader if you just are willing to put in the time. I mean, putting in the time and preparing every day is, is half the battle. You know, if you're not willing to spend a couple hours going through charts in the morning, trying to find the right setups, then you're probably going to miss the best setups. I, I I couldn't agree more. I would I would argue it's probably more than half the battle. It's probably yeah, I agree. It's probably seventy five percent of the battle, and the rest is emotional risk management. <laughs> well, risk management, emotional management, making right. sure like, are you doing what you said you were going to do? Are you following your plan? You know, are you being disciplined and actually following through? And and not not getting upset about taking a loss, like because I'd I'd rather. I'd rather take a 2% loss than just keep lowering my stop loss. And then three days from now, I'm taking a 10 or 15% loss. Well, I mean, the old, the old rule of taking losses is the first and most important rule. And it, it will be when, until we're dead and gone. Right. You know? And the reality is it, until you get comfortable, and this is true in any form, whether you're a trader or investor, uh, if you're going to play in markets at all, you have got to you know, it's, it's just a cost of doing business. And if you don't look at it that way, it's not fun. No one likes losing. Um, but the reality is if you don't look at it in that very non-emotional way, uh, even if you take losses, but you're constantly getting angry or frustrated, like you're just, um, you're going to be in for trouble because the market is going to put the screws to you at some point in terms of where you're not just taking one loss, you're taking many small losses in a row. Um, and, that will destabilize it you screws both. with your head. Yeah. Yeah. It, it hurts you. It hurts you both financially and then emotionally. And then once your head's wrong, you're going to have a hard time, you know, coming back from that. I mean, I tell me Ted Williams was the best hitter of all time. 
And his batting average is, you know, the record is 406. I mean, that means he only got to hit 40% of the time and he's the best, best batter of all time. So like if you're, you know, I mean, you can, you can put up huge numbers with a 40% win rate. You may not even need a 40% win rate, you know, as long as you're managing risk and you're, you know, your winners are three, four times bigger than your losers. I know. I love the Ted Williams analogy. And, and the funny thing is, I think I remember watching a documentary on him or something like that. And he was one of the first guys that really seemed to understand his own metrics in terms of hitting, or at least he took it to another level. Like he sort of knew intuitively when I swing, obviously you got to swing at strikes, but he knew even within the strike zone where his highest percentage right. opportunities were. I mean, it, Going back to, you know, what he was playing, that was way ahead. You know, there was no oh, yeah. metrics. Guys wouldn't break it down <laughs> tape. They didn't even have that. But he intuitively understood that. And I think he even, I think he wrote a book on this where he like broke down the strike zone into nine different zones and things like that. And that's really, you know, how, that's, that's how trading kind of works is you got to know those type of things and where your sweet spots are. Um, and Taking, a, you know, as you know, my one of my mentors would say, a surgical type approach um, to your to your trading. I mean, even earlier this year, I used to I was trading some of these, you know, these DTL, these downtrend line breakouts, and I've just realized, like, more often than not, they just don't work for me. You know, like I, I tried a bunch of them, I probably lost more money on them than I made, so now I focus on you know other setups that seem to have a, a higher hit rate for me. Well, uh, and, and there, you made a really great subtle point there though the only reason you came to that conclusion i'm guessing was because you were tracking this stuff oh yeah i have a spreadsheet to take, tracks every well, right. trade. Yeah. <laughs> to take the ted williams analogy though you're doing that work under you know well at, at some point yeah when if, if that setup has no positive expectancy why in the world would you take it exactly most people don't track that stuff and if they do they're they're not using it to let it influence their decision they're not letting the spreadsheet into their actual trading, you know, where it's like, I take the opposite approach. I remember tracking things early on. And this is a great rule for, I don't care what kind of trader you want to be. I, I don't care. Track everything though. Take good notes and then start looking for patterns, for lack of a better word, within your own trading. Maybe you'll find, and some people are no question that they, they will trade certain setups or more comfortable with certain yeah. setups. I'm the same way. So, because we have personalities, we're human. Um, some people don't mind, you know, buying a breakout to new highs. Other people are like, I, I'd rather buy the first, you know, pullback beforehand as it turns. Like, fine, like that. That's not wrong. Um, but to your point, you know, track that stuff and yeah, then find sure. out where where is the bread really being buttered here. Uh, and if it's not, then you you either have to conclude that your criteria is bad, you know, is flawed. Or at least the market is not in a conducive period for you know your strategy. So this is Monday, June twelfth. I think this interview will be posted tomorrow. But just so the, the the watchers know, so tomorrow morning we get CPI, and then Wednesday morning we get PPI, and then Wednesday afternoon we get FOMC. So what do you do in your portfolio, knowing now? I don't think these CPI reports are quite as meaningful as they were maybe a year ago when we were getting like these monster numbers and the market was you know always at risk of a big two three percent gap down like i don't think that's going to happen anymore but you never know but how do you manage your money or hedge or do anything else heading into these you know these big data reports uh, i'm gonna maybe get flack for this but the the answer is i don't uh i i, I tend to ignore the news almost uh universally. And what I mean by that is not, I'm not a, what's, what's the headline? What's moving the market? I don't care. Okay. Um, I want to be agnostic to all that stuff. And I, I, you know, I've heard people criticize me for this and that type of thing. It's like, listen, whatever's driving the market by definition is late. You know, by the time you and I figure out what, you know, and have, has anybody ever noticed that the talking heads, they'll always come up with a reason for why oh, yeah. X, Y, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're listening to the wrong thing. Let the market tell you, you know, I don't really, it, I don't really even care. I mean, look, I, if, if let's say we're, I get off the call with you or, or you and I, you know, as we're having this conversation, realize, holy cow, the market just tanked a thousand points. I'm not saying I, you know, I won't 
I won't look on a, a Bloomberg or whatever news to see if, you know, is there a, did a war breakout somewhere? Is there a disaster going on? Um, but as a general rule, I have risk management on all my positions. So I'm, I'm expecting that to do the job rather than, you know, well, Fed did a surprise, whatever. Well, the market is going to tell me, uh, you know, whether I'm right or wrong ahead of all that stuff. And, uh, you know, in 2020, you know, it, it, in every cycle, it's different. You made an interesting point about how CPI is not driving things the way it was like last year. CPI was the big one, you know, right. uh, and I was in a lot of cash. So I was just watching and the CPI print would yeah, come out and the market would tank or come, you know, rip because everyone's then assuming, well, the Fed's going to do this or whatever. And they were all wrong, uh, you know. And look, if, if you're a volatility guy, I'm not saying you can't trade around that stuff, you know, in different cycles, though, it's always something, you know, that is is going to move, you know, the overall market. Now, will that knock me out of positions occasionally? Sure. Um, but I was probably going to get knocked out of those anyway. Um, I, I just look at it as like, again, if you're waiting for everything in terms of new, you know, you've got a whole process. That's what I do. My process actually allows me to be insulated from you know, headlines and noise or whatever. And I have found that often when I'm in a really good period or the process is telling me you're in a good period and it's scary out there, that's the best scenario. Uh, like I can promise you this right now in terms of uh, one of the scenarios I am re- I'm hoping for is that we, this recession that everybody's predicting for the most, tar- you know, most called for recession in the history of my career anyway, I hope it shows up and the market starts trending higher. Because everybody's going to go, this is, this is, this doesn't make any sense. And this is a short and get out. The economy is rolling over. Um, forgetting that the market is a forward looking discounting mechanism. Uh, cause at some point, and, and maybe this, maybe the session will be bad and we sell off and, and then it gets even worse. And we don't sell off and the market starts going higher and everybody will go, Oh, you know, haven't you seen the economic numbers? And I mean, that was like one of the early lessons I learned. Bull markets are born out of recessions. Um, so one, I'm just thinking oh. one of the reasons. One of the reasons not to worry about CPI and whatnot is if you're in the strongest stocks in the strongest sectors that have been getting accumulated by institutional investors, those are the ones that should hold up the best, anyways, right? Absolutely. And and the reason you have a stop or risk management protocols for when they don't, because as you said, like if, if something really is a high flyer. Uh, you know, there's something called the 50-80 rule uh, that Mark Minervini talks about. And I think William O'Neill wrote about and the, the idea is like, eventually these stocks, though, are going to have big breaks, even the big leaders. You know, the 50-80 rule says that, you know, 50% of these stocks are going to have an 80% decline and 80% are going to have a 50% decline, the biggest winning stocks in history. Wow. Really? Uh, well, Jesus, yes. that's, that's scary. <laughs> that, that's, the, these, these are, I didn't make this stuff up. This is like oh studying a hundred years of, of the biggest winners in the history of the stock market. Well, what that tells me is I better have a stop that tells me to get out well ahead of time. And if you looked at actually most look of at, 20, look at most NVIDIA. Of, NVIDIA dropped 50%. Just a year ago, <laughs> it was closer to seventy, I think. But if you look at, if you look at, if you look at, you know, I was talking about this. Even go back to my uh, Twitter thing last year's. Uh, you know, I was just highlighting a lot of these former growth blowups, saying, "Hey, this is fifty eighty rule all over the place." I mean, yeah. these stocks are going to go down fifty to eighty percent, and I mean, PayPal and Square and all the even, cloud, even all Tesla. the cloud names, Tesla you know, and all, Cloudflare most of the, and I think, yeah. I think all the mega caps. With the exception of Apple and Microsoft, had fifty percent breaks. Wow, those are big. I know Amazon did. Yeah, Amazon did. I think Meta. I think Meta was oh, Meta was definitely close, did close to Meta, eighty. Meta was uh, close to eighty. Netflix, remember- Netflix too. Yeah, so, oh, like, it doesn't. It doesn't <laughs> matter the size of the company. Like it, this, it's just. It's like one of these. Uh, it's like first principles, you know, in metaphysics or in physics. Like it's just, you know, like uh, it's the way speculation works. And in and, and these markets, so that don't ever fall in love with the stock. Um, and this is where you have to have some type of risk management plan, especially if you're going to be playing in growth and momentum, though, because we talked about the biggest names, but some of these smaller names oh, have yeah. got, I mean, they just got murdered. You Down know? 90, 95% in some cases. And yeah. some of them that some of them we will never hear from again, oh, probably. For sure. yep. So that's what keeps you, <laughs> you know, it, it keeps you out of stuff and people, Every now and again, oh, I remember you traded this stock three or four years ago. What do you think of it now? And I was like, I don't even remember what that name was because I sold it a long time ago. 
either either for a profit or for a loss, and it hasn't come across my radar anymore. And then you look it up, and it's at like two bucks, or or it's at fifty cents, and you're like, well, why didn't you sell it? Well, I fell in love with the story, and like you can't have it both ways. You cannot be a value guy and a growth guy, right. at least in the same trade. I'm not saying like if you want to be somebody who trades, you know, this over here is a value trade, uh, and th- then this is a growth trade. I-, I wouldn't recommend that either. But you cannot combine them into the same trade, if that makes sense. Right. I heard a joke the other day. I mean, I guess I heard it before, but for whatever reason, this one just it stuck. Where they said, "What what's the definition of a a stock that's down ninety percent?" And they said it was a stock that was down 80% and then dropped another 50%. <laughs> that's a, that's a and that's what people were saying, like, oh, my stock's down 80%. It can't possibly go any lower. And then it goes down another 50%. And I think this is one of the, it's a great point, obviously, you know, in terms of, and this is where people don't, because they don't often understand how the math even works. You know, when your stock loses 50%, you don't need 50% to get back to even, you need 100 you know, and and the losses work geometrically against you, which is why it is such to your advantage to try and keep your losses small, your drawdowns small, because you can come back from them that much quicker. The bigger a hole you dig in, the first rule, uh, you know, when you find yourself in a hole, put down the shovel, stop digging. Uh, you know, you've- there's, there's a reason that once hedge funds are down 25, 30%, they just shut down the fund and return the money because they know how much, they know how hard it is to get back to even. Well, or the, in, 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 in many cases, which, yeah, I, I think that's a completely disingenuous model, but part of it is, is functional. They, they can't get paid anymore. So right. their business, oh, ceases, too, yeah. their, cease, their <laughs> business literally ceases to be, right. you know, operational because a lot of their bonus, how are they going to procure talent? All this their kind of performance stuff. fee is out the window. <laughs> exactly. And who wants to be, you know, who wants to be at a hedge fund that isn't going to be paying on bonuses? Right. <laughs> Um, what have been some of your big winners this year? And, uh, even over the last couple of years, you know, I mean, like uh, you obviously know that, I mean, the trends, you know, it was cloud and e-commerce and all of that in 2020. And then 2021, it was like, you know, it was, was it energy or was energy 2022? 22, 20, I'll, I'll say this in terms of very big winners. I haven't had any since 21 because it's been, it has been a much more rotational market. So any, uh, and I had a down year last year, which, you know, was, n- you know, never something anybody wants. It was, you know, well within what is, uh, what we would expect in terms of a, when things go really poorly and you lose a little, um, not a lot, but yeah, 22 was, was really the, the year of rotation. Once something rotated to the top, it generally got sold into, um, which is often how even bear markets work. It's not that things don't go up. They just, it's hard for any trend to sustain itself. Uh, energy came in last year hot and then it sold off, you know, say toward the middle back part of the year. Um, this year, it's been much more selective. I, you know, if I've had a big winner, it's been NVIDIA, but uh, I, I've sort of been taking a, a very cautious approach. Um, so I haven't had a lot of huge winners this year. I did get the NVIDIA is a really good example of how I, I got the technicals and fundamentals 100% correct, but because I haven't been seeing the ball very well, I didn't have a big position. Um, where if if we were in a healthier bull market, I would have had a bigger line in NVIDIA and and been holding maybe even a larger position. Um, NVIDIA was tricky though too because you had to sit there and hold into earnings multiple times. So uh, I was just, just going to ask you what you do during earnings. Do you do you hold into earnings, but depends on the on your cushion? Exactly right. You know, I just like again, I'm always thinking risk first, and so NVIDIA is a really good example. I was expecting. Um, prior to you know this last earnings call, obviously everybody was uh, caught asleep. I think the mark, I think the option market was pricing in something like a nine or a ten percent move, and it went thirty. Uh, that was you know that there's your two standard deviation um, you know risk management event, you know positive or negative. I'm always thinking about it from the negative side, and we saw a lot of earnings blow ups this year, a lot more. A lot more 20, 25 percent downs, right. you know, on a company warning than than a name like Nvidia going up that much. Um, so I reduced even. I had a cushion, but I said, you know, I don't want to give this whole thing back. I've got to, I've got a risk management being prudent. Got to trim some. Obviously, just goes to show you, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, if, well, if the, I, look, look at the analysts. There's like 50 analysts that cover Nvidia, and none of them were anywhere close to that. Q2 guidance. So it's like and, well, and I would never put a whole lot of stock in the analysts, oh, right? Because no. you know, they're not trading it. It's like right. <laughs> unless management's like feeding them like these little nuggets, like they're just 
They, they don't know what they can't do or say anything. Well, and they tend to be conservative, yeah. of course. And this is this is why you know when when a stock like Nvidia does what it does uh, to me, and when you look at the amount of volume that thing traded, it, yes, it's extended in the short run, but that is potentially telling you this is a this is a key leader in the new, in a new market. Obviously, AI is extremely hot right now. Uh, I would not be chasing it here, but I held on a portion of the position. Um, and then, you know, I'm just, but I'm not going to let that, that's a good example of a trade that is potentially turning into a, you know, longer term hold. Well, not potentially, it is. I've now, I've now basically de-risked the trade, um, taken some profits off the table. And now I'm willing to ride that, you know, winning remainder with a sort of a trailing backstop. So uh, it's like best case scenario, I still win. Uh, you know, from in terms of my original risk capital, that's how I'm handling it. Uh, you know, bigger winners historically. Um, I mean, I've had I've had lots of different ones. I've also had I've had periods where years where I didn't have any one big winner. It was just lots of lots of base hits, lots of yeah, lots of doubles, and triples. <laughs> exactly. Sort of you know, back to the Ted Williams. Well, Ted Williams was both. He had the slugging percentage and the batting average. He was the rare. Uh, <laughs> the reason he's probably the greatest hitter ever lived, but. You know, where I've had years where, yeah, you, you just hit lots of base hits again and again and again. And then I've had some years where I've had some, you know, really big trades and winners as well. We can get into that if you want, but um, yeah, whatever, whatever you think's best. And uh, in terms of like, how much leverage will you use in a, in a good market where you're seeing the ball well, uh, lots of great setups, markets trending higher, like in that, I mean, will you go 200%? Uh, I will. Uh, and, you know, leverage to me is reserved for the best of times. You know, it's, and I, I often think of, you know, leverage is like, uh, like any powerful tool. Like, like 2020 uh, when Powell's got the, uh, the money printer out. <laughs> and, yeah. The irony is like 2020 was the last time when I was using what I would call a very large amount of leverage. You know, <laughs> there were points in 2020 where I was buying and my broker was saying, you can't buy anymore. Uh, you're, you're tapped out. Max, I, I was, I got tapped out too. So. Um, but I want to be very clear uh, for anyone thinking that, you know, market is just a cowboy and he just goes in there and, and buys, you know, positions with big leverage. Uh, I I see leverage like I like I would a power tool or a chainsaw. You know, chainsaw is very dangerous in the hands of a fool, um, but in someone who knows how to use it, it's an extremely right. valuable tool. Um, but you know, and you also don't use a chainsaw on anything you need to cut. Right. You know, right. like you have you have different tools for different things, and so I will use if I am a hundred percent long. And here's the funny thing: people ask me, like, well, "When do you go on leverage?" I don't. Honestly, I don't. It's not like I have a thing on my desk that that an alarm that goes off and said, "Now you're using leverage." I have my, you know, I'm focusing on the stocks and trading things. So it's like if I have a bu bunch of exposure on and I see a lot more ideas, I'm just going to start buying. I'm buying more positions. You I'm know, the it's same like, way. Yeah. And so, and then I, then I might realize, holy smokes, I'm, I, you know, I'm not saying I'm completely oblivious to it because I'm I'm running, trying to run in real time. Like, how much risk are we carrying? Um, because we, we always want to have that in our head in terms of everything goes south. What are we, what are we going to, what are we going to lose? You know, worst case scenario, what's our loss? Um, well, I want to be in, in those good periods. I want to be staying on the accelerator. So there've been, there've been times, you know, yeah, where I'll use, you know, two, two times, you know, 200, 200% invested, uh, but they'll be select. And then the further you go out, sort of the risk curve in terms of leverage, the quicker you have to be to delever. Right. So the, the minute you start feeling pressure, you have to you have to act quickly. You can't wait around. You know, if you're if you're just dipping some toes in the market, you can give stocks a lot of room. When you're when you've got a lot of exposure on uh, and you're actively managing, you have to actively manage, meaning yeah. you, you, to the degree that you are um, extra, extra of, disciplined. <laughs> exactly right. To the degree that you're almost over your skis is how quickly you have to slow down. Right, right. Um, anything else you wanted to talk about before we wrap up here? You know, it's funny, you know, like I said before, people, people want to, you know, reach out via Twitter or, you know, check out what we're doing at, at Minervini. They're welcome to do that. And I think what I've noticed or, or learned over the years in trying to even help uh, and coach folks in this is that what is most important is not sexy. Um, you know, I, I, Everybody wants an idea, uh, and the ideas are those come and go. You know, if, if you and I sat there and, 
hey, what's your best idea right now? It's like, well, I could. That's I, the problem with Twitter. It's like everyone's looking for a shortcut, and like there really yeah. isn't a shortcut. You you nailed it. You nailed it. And and you know, to me, it, you and I have a fifty minute conversation. There's one or two golden nuggets in here for somebody that is a light bulb to go ah. You know, that's what I need to really put into my process uh, that will make, that will help me, whether it's tracking your trades, being more disciplined, having a plan. You know, there's a number of these things. And I'm just amazed though, you know, I've had the privilege of knowing a number of really successful traders over the years in many different styles, but what they all have in common is some of these timeless things that we're talking about, you know, risk management, emotional management being disciplined, having a process, and and really not focused on people are too obsessed about, you know, the idea. Oh, you know, well, Mark Ritchie doesn't want to give us his, his his entry point or his favorite stock. No, because my favorite stock, I don't have a favorite stock. Right, well, my, my, to, it changes every day. Well, right, right. <laughs> because you you're because you're not you're thinking about this in terms of, you know, it's a risk management business. It's not a pet stock, but pet rock business. You know, you're not selling pets. Uh, you know, this one will make a great pet for you know whatever. It's like <laughs> you're you're trying the the best the the guys and gals that are the best at this. In my opinion, they treat it like a business, um, and and one that has to be you know managed. And that's true again. I think regardless of strategy, it's like they're they're looking you know through their lens and playing their game. Uh, and most, you know, most folks on Twitter don't have a game. That's why they're, you know, trying to figure out, uh, you know, well, what does this guy do? And what does that guy do? So, yeah, I, I would encourage people to um, focus on process and then on themselves in terms of how do you get better at what you do? Uh, and and just ignore, there's just so much noise, you know, Twitter. <laughs> Look, I, I read occasional stuff on Twitter. Oh, yeah. I, I, there's, a lot, the there's a lot of really smart people out there. Don't oh, get sure. me wrong. Um, and, but if you're going to look at that stuff, you, you better not let that override your actual process. Now, if there's a way you can use that to, you know, as part of your thing, that's fine. Um, I, I'd be a little skeptical that, that most people can navigate that whole world really, really well. So even it's like follow two people on Twitter, not 20. Right. I mean, that there's a few sense. guys that post their, like their morning watch list. And I always... Look at that because there's always a few stocks on there that you know I that are you know that I have in common with them. And there's other times like someone will post you know their watch list, and I'm looking at those I'm looking at the stocks on charts, and I'm like I have no idea what they see. Like I don't I don't see why this is a compelling setup. But you know some people like it's like they have this small little list of stocks that they watch every day, and it doesn't matter what they're doing. Like those are the stocks that they're most comfortable trading, and. I'm not like I could, you know, I might love one stock one day, but if it, if, if it fails to break out and loses the 10 day or the 20 day, like it's, it's gone, you know, I, I, yeah. well, I think, I think you just, you just nailed it right there when you said like, you know, that might be fine for them or whatever, but for you, right. you know, you're doing your own thinking, you know, you're not letting, you know, if somebody else likes it and it doesn't, who cares, who cares if they like it or they hate it. You know, one of the things that I usually say is like, no professional lets somebody else talk them into or out of their position because you have the position on because you've gone through you've gone through the process to say this is why Jonah owns X here you know here's my risk points and and now I'm in it uh, if I come on and I go oh you're in you know I think that's a stupid idea what do you care you're a <laughs> professional uh, it, you should I love it when people hate my ideas or think I like if, if I get bullish on the market and everybody is skeptical pessimistic and all like that makes me excited um, you know so you've got to be willing to you know for lack of a better word ignore ignore all that stuff or if you to be able to take it in but without letting it influence you which is often harder than most people realize. Oh, yeah. And CNBC is even worse than Twitter. <laughs> I never. I, I mean, look, I never watch it, so I, you, you don't see a TV, you know, with CNBC on in my office for a reason. <laughs> well, uh, Mark, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy, so uh, we we definitely appreciate it, and uh, certainly wish you the best. And let's do it again six months or so. Uh, come back and chat. I'd love to. Thanks, Jonah. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Bye.